Welcome back, everybody. Coffee with Colada. Uh, today, a special treat for you. We have a guest who's going to come on, uh, and maybe you've heard of him, maybe you haven't heard of him. I've just recently uh, met, met him, and uh, let me introduce you to him. So, everyone, this is Ori Spado. Good morning, everybody, and thank you, Adam, for having me here. And I'm having my espresso with you. Oh, fantastic. Um, Ori. And here's to Frank, who we just lost. Here's to Frank. Ori, did you know Frank Collada? I did not know Frank Collada. I knew of Frank Collada because I, Dennis Griffin worked with me on my book, The Accidental Gangster. There was an occasion where Dennis did ask me if Frank could stay with me because there was, there was some other author that was going to do some event and wanted Frank and I there. And I told Dennis, yeah, certainly you could stay with me, but the event never happened. But personally, I never met Frank Collada. I do know some stories about Frank that uh, Nick Pelleggi, who was a dear friend of mine, and he was the author and the writer of Casino. And in a way, maybe for most folks, but there's a scene in the film Casino. And uh, I don't know if a lot of people probably don't even realize, but Frank was actually in the film himself in addition to being a consultant. And if it were not for Frank, because Frank was the first one to go on board with Nick Pelleggi. And if it were not for Frank, it might not have ever gotten made. Because after that there, uh, when, the, when they were making it and De Niro was going to play Rosenfeld, that's when Rosen, Rosenfeld, the name is, right? Rosenfeld, yes. Yeah. Uh, that's when he called Nick. He said, is De Niro really going to play me? Then I'm in. <laughs> but anyways, there's a scene in there uh, that I believe it took place at a swimming pool. And where a guy gets killed. And they're all on, on the set there, Nick, Scorsese, De Niro. And Nick looks at Frank Collada, and Frank's sitting there shaking his head. Nick went over and said, what's wrong? He said, that's not how it happened. That's all wrong. And Nick said, well, how would you know that? He said, because I'm the guy that really did it. So Frank actually got to kill that guy twice in his life. Colada, colada, grab your favorite brew. Ask a question, he'll answer it for you. The mafia, the mafia, the mafia, the mafia. You better hit prescribe if you know what's good for you. Drinking a cup of coffee with Frank Colada. He'll tell you a lot of, he's Frank Colada. How do you know... Nick Pelleggi. I met Nick Pelleggi over 20 years ago. Uh, for those people who don't know, I was very close friends with Sonny Franchese, uh, the underboss of the Colombo crime family. We were friends for over 40 years. And as most people know, Sonny spent 40 years of his life in and out of prison, well, actually 40 years in prison. And his wife, Tina, there was a reporter, what the hell was his name, Jack Newman, who had information that Sonny was framed on the, he got a 50 year conviction uh, for bank robberies, which Sonny had nothing to do with and didn't even know the guys. Uh, but they lied and said they paid tribute to Sonny Franchese, that he was the organizer, which was totally false. But Sonny got 50 years on that. And so Tina invited him, along with Nick Pelagi and their wives, to dinner at their home. Sonny lived on Shrub Hollow Road in Roslyn, New York. I could find my way there blindfolded. When they left the house, and Tina walked them out, 
she put her arm around Jack Newman and said, if you can give me that information, I'll get you one free murder. Um, wow. So that's how you got acquainted with Nick Pelleggi. And that's oh, the so, uh, yeah, then after that there, she, it was actually Tina who put me in touch with Nick Pelleggi and asked me to talk to him. And that's how Nick and I became friends. And Nick said, Ori, the real story is not with Sonny. The real story is with Tina, his wife. If you can get somebody to sit with her, somebody you trust, and you can just give me eight or 10 pages, I'll see to it that it gets on the right desk. So my daughter lives in upstate New York, my daughter Gina, and she went and spent the weekend with Tina. And my daughter had tape recorder and sat with Tina and everything for a whole weekend. And you have to know Tina to really appreciate this here. When my daughter got back, she couldn't figure out why the tape machine, there was nothing on it. And I told my daughter, I said, that's because Tina shut it off when you weren't looking. He's a wonderful guy, he's a sweetheart, but uh, He's an encyclopedia of organized crime. And, you know, and he sits at home and he just keeps banging out scripts. You know, people don't understand Hollywood. Here it is, you had Nick Pelleggi, an A-list writer, just paid big money, the studio's paying big production companies, he gets paid up front. You know that he did Goodfellas. You know he did Hoosiers and a couple others. And I asked Nick, because I always know the scripts that he's working on. I had a conversation with him. I says, Nick, let me ask you a question. You're Nick Pelleggi. You're writing all these scripts. How many scripts have you written? He says, Lori, he says, it's in the hundreds. I says, how many films have you gotten made? He says, four. I says, and you're Nick Pelleggi. He says, Ori, I got one better for you. He says, there are two scripts that we're trying to sell now, written by me and Martin Scorsese. He says, we can't sell them. So, you just don't know in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. I've been around Hollywood for over 40 years. Uh, I understand you knew Meyer Lansky. Yes, I did. Can How do you, you know that? that? Huh? Can you tell me about that? Well, you know what? It was during the time that they were approving gambling in Atlantic City. Meyer lived in Florida. Ironically, Meyer stayed at the Warwick Hotel, which was my home for over 35 years. And Meyer had the suite above me. And he and I became friends in the evening. I would walk with him, and he always had his dog with him. And we walked down 54th Street to 5th Avenue, over to 57th, up, back up to 6th. And we had a lot of conversations as we walked. He was a very intelligent guy and a very nice guy. And he was intelligent in so many different things. You say you don't like Henry Hill, or you didn't like Henry Hill. Where did I say that? Um, one of the interviews that you did, you said that you weren't very fond of Henry Hill. I was not fond of Henry Hill. was an addict and a drunk. How could you be fond of somebody like that there? And he was an informer, you know, let anybody do what they want to do. But, you know, I'm not thrilled with informants because, A, number one, they lie. They're groomed by the FBI and the U.S. attorney to lie. And when Richard Nixon 
signed the RICO Act and put it into effect while he was in office. His main intention was to try to stop the drugs that were going on. That did not happen, as we know, and to this day, it has not happened. But what that RICO Act did, if you really study it, it gave the FBI and the U.S. attorney the ability to be able to lie and get away with it. And that's what happens. You know, Sunday franchise went away because of informants who lied. I, I did a gun charge. I did five years, a minimum mandatory sentence on a 924C gun charge. 60 months. The judge said, Mr. Spado, on that charge, my hands are tied by Congress. I did my time. What do you think happened a year ago last June? The U.S. Supreme Court declared that the 924C gun charge was unconstitutional and illegal and shall be vacated from everybody's record. And guys who were in prison on those charges, they got released. Other people got it vacated. I wrote the letter of the judge a letter to vacate mine, I thought it'd be a simple procedure. A month later, I get a letter from the U.S. Attorney on a Friday afternoon. I go down on my mailbox, there's a Federal Express page. I read the first page, U.S. Attorney. The same one that was prosecuting me is still there in Brooklyn. And she states that my charge should be vacated. I get upstairs here, I'm sitting in my chair, I read the rest of it. On page four, it says, in the event that Mr. Spadle's charge is vacated, then we hereby bring back charges one and 10. I go, what the fuck? And I wrote the judge another letter, and I said, hey, I wrote that letter to you without the advice of an attorney. Forget about everything. Well, he assigned an attorney to me. The attorney calls me. Tells me, oh, don't worry, I'll handle this here. You got a court date, you got to come back February 4th. I said, I'm not coming back to Brooklyn. I don't want to step in that courtroom ever again. I said, you tell me, don't worry. I said, I don't see your name on those papers. I said, it's my name. How can they do this when the statute of limitations have run out twice on those charges? He says, what's your plea agreement? So I dug out my plea agreement. And on one page of my agreement, on page four, it says, should a charge be vacated, they have a right to bring back the dismissed charges. On the very next page, it says, all charges dismissed without prejudice, meaning they can never bring them back. So I says, How, what page do I listen to here? What page is correct? I've been out of prison for seven years. I've had no affiliation, nothing to do with anybody. I've been totally legitimate. How could they do this? Oh, don't worry. I just spoke to Miss. I said, I told you don't work. Don't talk to her. Oh, no. She said, if you come in and you sign a new plea agreement. I said, why should I sign a new plea agreement? <laughs> when I got one that's dated September 2010. I got to sign another one for 2020? Not going to happen. I said, withdraw everything. And that's what I, the way I left it. And that gun charge, nobody caught me with a gun. I was not at the scene of the robbery. But an informant said that he saw me give the gun to somebody else. And that informant did not see me get that gun. I know absolutely 100% he didn't see me. He wasn't in the room. So was the gun real or was it a fake gun? Nobody knows. 
Mediano. So you did 62 months for that? Yes, I did. What was that like? I've never been to prison. Don't go. Not a good place, I hear. Nah, you know, it wasn't, you know, like, you know what I mean? It, it was a uh, natural instinct the day I got arrested, the day I put in prison, you just changed your mind. And now, you know, your life has changed, you know? And being an Italian involved in organized crime, us guys were very respected in prison. Uh, so I never had any problem, no issues along that nature, no. Uh, even a lot of the guards respected us. You know, Frank told me the same thing. He showed me photographs of him at a payphone with a jacket on, right, a, with a cigar, right, holding up. And he said, he said to me, he said, yeah, I was at the, the payphone here when the guard took the picture of me. He said, that jacket's the guard's jacket. He gave it to me to put on the picture and brought me the cigar. I said, <laughs> well, you're kidding me, right? He said, no. He said, they, they loved us. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, Frank was in at the time you were allowed to smoke. Oh, you couldn't smoke while you were there. You can't smoke in federal prison or any prison from now on. For my, but federal prison, no. So you didn't smoke for 62 months? And then you started smoking months, again? I, smoke. I got out. I lasted two weeks without a cigarette. And then I went and bought a pack. Uh, uh, I, I smoked. I stopped. But You stopped? I did. I stopped. I started, stopped, started, stopped. I've done that. But no more. I just watched Frank go from smoking, and I'm, I can't. Well, Frank, Frank has COPD very bad. He, he had COPD, congestive heart failure, diabetes. He had several uh, problems. But, man, his breathing, yeah, not. Did Frank smoke his cigarettes way down? You know, I don't know because I never saw him smoke a cigarette. I know, though, that he told me. In the 80s, he was smoking four packs a day, that he, he was up to four packs a day. And he said it was from all the stress of being followed around by the police all the time, you know, being chased and, you know, the constant stress of doing, are they going to catch me for this? Are they going to catch me for this? Are they, you know, yeah. and yeah, I can imagine that I would be very you stressful. See, the cigarette? Yeah. People say I smoke a lot, but look at the size of that cigarette. Huh? I'm putting it out. <laughs> well, I take three, maybe four puffs from a cigarette, and I put it out. Yeah, I'm a homeless man's dream. I learned long ago that the worst part of the cigarette, where you get all, and I, you know, I'm healthy. I just had a blood test, but I'm a diabetic, and I have four stents. Okay, and. But I watched myself very carefully, and I walked, I exercised, and so forth. Uh, and you know, you say Frank was a diabetic. You know what's really funny? In prison, especially in Brooklyn, because we have, it was flooded with Italian guys back in Brooklyn, you know, from all the families. I would say the majority of them are diabetics. Why do you think that is? It was crazy. I mean, you would see us. It was like 5 o'clock in the afternoon that all the diabetics were allowed to go down to get their shot, insulin shots, and the, and, and, and the medical unit in Brooklyn. I mean, there were a few guys who said they were diabetics and weren't just to get there to be able to talk to the other guys, you know, I mean, have a little meeting or something. But, you know. Yeah, most of them were really diabetic. Wow. Yeah. Um, so I saw in a video that you did with Vlad, um, you, uh, I guess, Michael Francis said some things uh, about you and you rebuttaled and you guys kind of got into a little back and forth. And I understand I saw a video that you put up uh, on 
on your channel that uh, pretty much basically ending it. Is it okay if I show the video? Go ahead. Okay. There's podcasts where I raised out and Michael Franchise. Now, when I looked at those videos, I said, that's not Ori Spado. That's not the guy that I know. Ori Spado's a gentleman. He tells the truth, always. But he's a gentleman. I didn't like that Ori Spado. And these battles, how they began, we won't get into that. But it's got to end. So therefore, I'm ending this battle right now. From now on, anybody ask me about Michael Franche, if I cannot say anything positive, I will just say no comment. I read a book called Quitting the Mob by Michael Franche. There's something in that book. And Michael, I'll be the first to tell you, it helped me out. And I thank you for those few words, but I caught it. Michael, here on this day, I'm extending my arm to you. You're a smart guy. I'm a smart guy. Let's do something positive. You want to do something together? There's no need that you and I get on a podcast and tear each other apart. I'm taking all that information I have. It's buried. I don't want to see it, hear about it ever again. But Michael, you and I could do something positive. If you want to continue talking bad about me, by all means, that's your prerogative, and then go ahead and do it. I'm not going to jack, but I'm not going to fight it either because I have other things in life that are much more important. I made a promise to my children when I got out of prison that I would never go back. I'm keeping that promise. Michael, you have a great family. I think I met your wife, Cammie, on two occasions when you and I were looking for your brother, Johnny. You have a lovely family. Take care of your family, Michael. Take care of the people that love you. Because at the end of the day, that's all we have. Michael, your father, while living on this earth, as you and I both know, did not have one day of peace. But now your father is peace, in peace. He's with your mother, he's with uh, Gia, and there's no more arguing going on. Your mom and dad, regardless of how much fighting they did, one thing I know for sure, they loved each other. Uh, so is there anything else you'd like to say to uh, Michael Francis while we're on the subject of it already? You know, Michael, about five years younger than me, four or five years younger than me. And in reality, uh, let me read. At the end of my book, my new book is going to be uh, available next week, new revised book. I wrote letters to a lot of my friends who have since passed away. My dear mate in London, Joy Pyle, I closest friend out here in Los Angeles, uh, uh, Jimmy Kachi, who was the underboss here in Los Angeles, he and I were like brothers. Uh, I also wrote letters to some living people. And I have here a letter that I wrote to Michael Frances. You see, what Michael don't realize, a couple of the guys that were around him ended up being around me. And, you know, Michael never did nothing to me. I never done nothing to him except that sit down that we had at the Russian tea room. And I'll read a little bit about, I'll read a little about the letter. And if the people want to read the whole letter, then buy my book, The Accidental Gangster, Revised Edition. You can pre-order it next week on Amazon or go to my website and, and buy it. My website's www.theaccidentalgangster.com. Hi, Michael. I hope all is well with you and your family. I must say a lot of people are very disappointed 
that I ended the feud between us. And as I said, I no longer will be saying anything about you. However, there are a few things I feel necessary to say. Going back to 1978, 1979, you and I first laid eyes on each other at the Russian tea room. And now I'm going to skip. Yes, you are correct, as when I was with your father, you were never around and you were quite busy in those days. However, in the later days, I became close friends with Jerry Zimmerman, Bob Barish, Billy Ferranti, and other people that were around you. Billy went away because of the gasoline tax in Florida. Jerry Zimmerman, as you know, Michael, you promised him that when he had to go into court that day in Fort Lauderdale, that he would, you'd have a lawyer there and he would be bailed out. That didn't happen, Michael. There's other stuff in here of what the paperwork that Jerry Zimmerman carried around with him in the trunk of his car until the day he died. Where do you think that box is? And that's all in the letter that I wrote to Michael. And I also wrote a letter to Sonny. I go on talking about the first time he and I met through our dear friend Lou Perry. And I go in and I discuss a lot of the meetings, walk and talk meetings Sonny and I would have. And Sonny used to stay with me at the Warwick Hotel all the time when I'd come to New York. And we would have our meetings in the maid's room in the hallway. Never talked in the room. How did you meet Sonny Francis? I met Sonny Francis. I was a distributor for Polyglyco. Uh, you're probably too young to remember it. No need to shine your car again, guaranteed for three years. We were all over the world. And we were well known. And Walter gave uh, Nassau County to his brother-in-law, who happened to be related to Michael Franchese. And what they were doing, they were stealing warranties from the bottom of the pack of Walter's office. And they were selling an inferior product, calling it polyglycol. Walter found out and was threatening to take away the distributorship. And then all of a sudden, Michael, I uh, mean, Walter was getting death threats. And I told Michael, I, I told, I told Walter, I said, nobody's going to call you and threaten you. Somebody's going to kill you. They're just going to do it. You ain't going to know it. And so he wanted me to go into New York with him. I was in Florida and I flew into New York. We had a meeting with the biggest Cadillac dealer at the time, Victor Potomkin. We closed that deal and after we left, we all went to Club 21 for lunch. And Walter went to the phone to call his office. He come back, he's white as a ghost. And he leans over to me, he says, kid, I know you're wired in, but I just got another death threat, the same bullshit. You stay here a couple of days and try to find out. And that's when I ended up calling Lou Perry, who and he said, I'll pick you up at seven o'clock that evening. And we went to Trattatore Siciliana restaurant on Second Avenue, which was owned, happened to be owned by Sonny's son-in-law, Eugene. Nice, nice young man. Eugene was a great guy. And that's where I met Sonny Frances, his wife, Tina, Johnny Franchese was just a little boy who later testified against his father and me and others. Uh, his daughter Tina and his daughter Gia. So I met the whole family. Sonny and I sat there and whispered to each other. I explained to him. Sonny had no immediate knowledge of what was going on, but said he would dig into it, of which he did. And then he found out it was Michael. 
and that caused us having a sit down at the Russian table. And that's how you guys kicked it off, and then you just after that. It well, was you know, at, at the sit down, we're sitting there, and then Michael's sitting next to Sonny. I'm sitting next to Walter, and then in the desk with my friend, uh, in the aisle, sitting in chairs with my friend Lou, Lou Perry and Frank Russo. And as the sit down was progressing, I didn't feel Sonny was understanding it. So I says, excuse me, Sonny. I said, let me put in terms you might understand. I said, let's suppose somebody was moving in to your territory in the Bronx. And then with the coldest eyes you ever wanted to see in your life, he looked at me and he said, don't say a word. One of the rules, you're never supposed to say a word to sit down when you're there. And uh, unless you're questioned. And uh, he said, I'm going to forget, don't, he said, don't think for one moment that I don't understand what's going on. Keep your mouth shut. Which I did. I mean, you should have seen those eyes. I mean, it went right through me. But after the meeting, when we all walked outside, Sonny grabs me and walks me to the corner of Broadway and 57. He says, hey, kid, he said, you got a lot of boss. I like you. I want you and your family at my home for Christmas. And that began a 40-year friendship. Wow. Wow. It's pretty oh, amazing. Cool. It's yeah. Amazing. You've had a pretty amazing life, Ori. You've met a lot of people. You said you met Ronald Reagan. Well, yeah, Ronald Reagan. Uh, you know, I made a, mo a lot of money when he was president. I mean, I made a shitload of money when he was president. I don't know why. I just did. But there's a restaurant on Westwood Boulevard called Mateo. Uh, it was owned by Maddie Mateo who was from Hoboken, New Jersey. And uh, Frank Sinatra actually gave him the money to start the restaurant. They were close friends. So on a Sunday evening, Frank would be there with his wife, uh, you name it, whoever's in big names in town. And Ronald Reagan and Nancy came in every Sunday. And I always sat on the side of the restaurant where I could smoke. And we always had one table, particularly to so when Ronald Reagan would walk in, I mean, I, I'm like the first guy there. First, the Secret Service are before him and after him, you know what I mean? But he always put his hand on my shoulder. How you doing, young man? Did I know Ronald Reagan to sit down and talk with him? No, I didn't know him that way. But, you know, he, and how you doing, young man? You know, he put his hand on my shoulder because he would hold the railing as he was walking. Yeah. You know, How'd you make Frank, money? Frank, Frank would always come and get me because he'd be in the dining room with his wife. And he couldn't smoke around Nancy. So he'd come and get me because Frank and I knew each other. All right. He and I sit at the bar, bullshit, and smoke cigarettes. Even at his home, he had to go outside to smoke. Wow. I remember those days uh, when you went into the restaurant and they say, smoking or non smoking? That's yeah. like going to the pool and saying peeing or no peeing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what's the point? But um, yeah, that was, that was, that was a while ago. Okay. So I've seen in the videos uh, that you've put up uh, uh, and, and you've done on other channels and I've sat and read comments and a lot of people are writing in the comments. They say that you're a rat. What do you say to those people? Well, if I were a rat, I would not have done a minimum mandatory sentence because the only way you could break a min minimum mandatory sentence is by becoming an informant. That rat information comes from a kid named Kenji Gallo. 
Kenny always wanted to be around wise guys. One of the biggest liars again that you'll ever meet. I don't know if you recall the killing of Herbie Blitzstein in Las Vegas. I know who Fat Herbie Blitzstein was, and all of the prescribers know who Fat Herbie Blitzstein was. A lot of my friends were involved in that case. Kenny Gallo was an informant ready to testify in that case. And Bobby Milano's lawyer, Scotty, what's his first name? He shot himself later. Uh, no, the name, last name was Scotty. He's a good lawyer. For some reason, he and I are always on the same plane coming back from Vegas. There were a lot of superseding indictments. And I, believe me, I was fucking praying on every one of them because I thought they were going to call me in on that too, try to bring me in on that indictment. But how it began was with, uh, and I told Jimmy a long time ago, because Jerry Zimmerman said, Stay away from that kid, Kenny. He's been an informant since he was 15 years old in high school. So I never had nothing to do with him. But Jimmy, Jimmy would get money from him. He, he'll write and he writes in his bullshit book. You know, him and Jimmy were close friends. Not true. Jimmy couldn't stand him. But I was taping the FBI. FBI tried to get me to be an informant against Jimmy Cacci and uh, Joe Dente. Now, Joe Dente, I only met him in a restaurant. It's not like Joe and I were close friends. We knew each other. You know, I mean, I know a lot of people. Everybody knows a lot of people. The FBI were trying to get me an informant. They were questioning. And then one day, the FBI come and recorders. And... So I started taping the FBI because they're telling me, no, we're only interested in Italian gangsters, you know? So I found that to be very prejudicial. I taped them. I had 12 conversations. Uh, Jimmy was out on bail from a case down in Palm Springs. Jimmy always lived with me up there during the week. His home was in a cathedral city. And Jimmy and I went out to collect some money. And uh, I hit the guy. Um, when we left, he called the police. And, uh, you know, the guy identified me, but did not identify Jimmy Gotchi. I was on state probation at the time. Jimmy was out on bail. And one night they came and took Jimmy out of my home. And told me, don't bother bailing him out. He's not getting bail. And Jimmy's car was in my garage. And along, you know, on Jimmy's keychain was the house. House key, all the keys, you know. And a lawyer named uh, Mark. Mark is name, Mark. Mark Maisie. Mark Maisie was close to Kenny Gallo, but Mark was supposed to come and get Jimmy's car out of my garage. I gave Mark the keys. Who do you think he sends? He sends Kenji Gallo. Kenji Gallo takes the car down the palm train, probably with an FBI agent, and went to Jimmy's home. Got a lot of letters that Jimmy had from the police commissioner uh, in Palm Springs uh, and on. There were only three people who knew that I was taping the FBI. It was Jimmy Kachi. Oh, four people, my lawyer, but I wanted to go on record back east because I knew what could happen. And so Jimmy took the tape and he went back to Buffalo 
When Sonny was in prison, I couldn't go to Sonny's at all. So Jimmy went to Joe Todaro, who was the boss of Buffalo. And I'm sure you heard of Joe Todaro. Uh, and Joe had the biggest pizza place in, in Buffalo, still there. Uh, Bossa Nova, I think it's called. And uh, Joe was laughing his ass off. They called me up from there. And Joe wanted me to continue doing it. But when Jimmy got back, he said, you got to stop this. He said, you're going to get in real serious trouble. And so I had a meeting with the FBI set up, and Mark Maisie, the lawyer, went with me and informed them that I would not be an informant, this and that. But I you I taped the Ilfra Winfrey show one time and told the FBI I got a tape to blow your mind. And I met the agent, I said I need five grand for it. Oh, he gave me five grand. And then he was calling me, he said, there's nothing on this fucking tape. What I said, I don't know how you use that equipment. Oh, uh, and it did get me in trouble because in all honesty, when I got indicted, it was not for the charges they indicted me for. There's, there's no closer brotherhood than these FBI agents. You got to respect that. But, uh, and that's when Kenny tried to post one thing up with, and if you listen to the tape, if you listen to the tape, you will hear that I'm taping the FBI agent. But it's the captions that Kenji Gallo put up. It's still up there on Google. It's still up there. And he's got Ori Spado spills his guts or some shit like that there. But uh, going off the record, because I was talking about the Herbie Blissing thing, and that, that trial, uh, Jimmy did a little time, Bobby Panero, uh, Fat Stevie Sino, uh, all these guys I knew. And uh, you know, we know the outcome of that one. Kenny became a rat with the Colombo family in New York against Teddy Persico and others. And, you know, today on social media, people could say and do anything they want. They could fix anything to be anything that they want. So you really don't know what the hell the truth is today. You know, they tell me a lot of people get the news. I don't read the news off of Facebook or Instagram or that bullshit. I'm on it. I'm across all social media. I do not read the news. I read the news from the newspapers. So I know I'm getting fairly accurate news. But then again, you still got to read between the lines. You want to know what's really going on. That's the story. Kenji Gal. So that's why, that's why the people have left comments. That's why the people have left comments saying that, that's, uh, that, you, that you're a rat. And yeah, well, another thing, there was something with the Vlad thing. People calling me a rat. Hey, he's not a rat, but he's talking about Michael. That's Michael's supporters. God bless him. Sure, of course. You know, on my YouTube, I only got two things up on my YouTube. And one of them is that Michael Franchet's interview. I had over 6,000 people look at it. I only got, like I say, two things on there right now. It's going to build up. <laughs> we got show, eight shows in the can. Uh, another thing that uh, will be up shortly. Okay. But I, I read the comments and I, I just laugh. I, I know they're Michael's friend. God bless him. He's got it. He built it up. Sure. It's like Donald Trump. Donald Trump's got his handful of supporters. Yes. Nobody's got his handful. Everybody's you know I mean? got their zealots. Everybody's got, the, got it. We got the prescribers over here. It costs you yeah. a lot of you. Know? And you know what? I wish all those people would say bad things about me. I wish them the best. And I ask you, please continue to do that. Most definitely. All right. If, if anybody, uh, oh, oh, Ori, one more time, can you hold up your book and tell me about your book? And that it's going to be available, you said, next week, which is 
depending on when people are watching this, because we're taping on September 30th is when I'm taping. Listen to me. Yeah, yeah. This we're recording September. Not, it, my book is got a brand new cover, and it'd be available in hard copy. It currently is available in Kindle and audio book. All right, but we're going to have, uh, there's going to be a little special deal uh, for the first hundred people to buy off of my website. They'll get a little something special with it. Uh, Ori, what's your website? My website is www.theaccidentalgangster.com. And please subscribe to it. Uh, because my podcast is called The Accidental Gangster with Ori Spado and John Fondy, and we have a spectrum of guests from all over, uh, from all walks of life, from the entertainment business, gangsters, and uh, you name it, we are interviewing them. And I'm sure you're going to love the show. It's going to go across over. John Fondy has over a hundred different platforms, and he reaches millions of people uh, out of Las Vegas from his studio there in Las Vegas. Wonderful. So, that's, uh, that's wonderful. And, so, uh, Ori, if anybody does have a question, would you be willing to come back on and answer a question? If any Anytime. Okay, I'm well, happy to answer anybody's questions. Okay. And if people want to write to me directly, they can go uh, it's the accidental gangster at gmail.com. Okay. Write me. Good stuff, bad stuff. Wonderful. Um, it, so, if you guys want to write them directly and you have something you want to ask them, or you can just leave it in the comments below. And uh, if we have enough questions, we'll, we'll, we'll ask them to come back I'm on and answer some. Answer any sensible question. Uh, you know, people ask me about murders who murdered this person, who murdered that person. Well, you're not going to get an answer there. You know, so, I mean, think about the question you're going to ask me. You want to ask me a question about business advice? I'm more than happy. You want to ask me a question regarding something in my book that you might agree with or not agree with? Please write me. Uh, but I get a lot of people who are trying to gather information for, you know, about who killed Jimmy Hoffa. I wasn't there. I don't know who Jimmy called. I could take an educated guess. Maybe I heard something in the grapevine uh, from being around people. All right, but I was not there. And, you know, people ask me, who killed Kennedy? And people want a lot of information, this and that. Uh, you know, make your own judgment on who killed who, okay? And I don't believe it was Oswald that killed. Awesome. Well, Ori, thank you very much for coming on. My and, pleasure, uh, Adam. Thank I you so much. And we got to do this again. Most definitely. I appreciate right. you taking your time out of your day and, uh, and, and spending it here. And, and, uh, and listen, anything I could do to help you all personally, let me know. Okay? Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Right. I that. hope you continue. The show, uh, Coffee with Colada. Uh, if you need help getting other guests, I'd be more than happy to help you there. Well, thank you very much. Okay. You, Take right. care. Have, Have a good time. Bye -bye. Thanks for watching this video, everyone. Please be sure to visit frankcolada.com for coffee cups and t shirts. Also, hit the like button, share this video. Oh, and don't forget to hit that prescribe button, the subscribe, I found gold. I hope you enjoyed yourself. God bless.